Welcome to Rock Your Talk expert interview series with Lisa Reed. I have Chris Schleich with me here from Enterprise Automation. And before I introduce Chris, let me share a little bit about uh, what I do. Uh, I'm the founder of Get Speaking Gigs Now, where I coach speakers on how to get, get booked, uh, learn how to have an impact in their audience so they can attract their ideal clients. And then I also have the honor of training and speaking for Productive Learning, which is a self-mastery company. We have been uh, helping business owners and other people uh, with their emotional resiliency, their self-mastery, their emotional intelligence for 28 years now. And it is my pleasure to have Chris Schleich here. He is also a member of our Conscious Leadership Circle, one of the um, uh, more, you know, pretty cool, uh, pretty cool group that we have over at Productive Learning. Chris, uh, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about you. Uh, we'd love to hear about you. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. And I look forward to explaining how your work ties into engineering also oh. as part of this opportunity. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Tell me more. Tell me more. Yeah. So I, I work for Enterprise Automation here in Orange County, which is down the road from Productive Learning, right next to the coast. It's really nice. So we're an engineering services business. We, we specialize in uh, industrial automation, and we help our clients build automation systems they use to monitor their production facilities. So our typical client is going to own and operate crucial infrastructure to the public. And when we talk industrial automation, um, just about anything you can see in your visual field of view came from a plant where automation was a factor. There's solar panels on my uh, neighbor's roof, window panes, the shirt I'm wearing, these AirPods I have, uh, the glasses you're wearing, um, the water I drank this morning for breakfast wow. at all. Like everything. All industrial automation. <laughs> everything, literally. Wow. That's so, so cool. Yeah, there's plants that, you know, deliver safe drinking water, wastewater plants that protect local ecosystems. We have a huge facility here in Orange County that does, I think, like 50 million IV bags a year and things like that. So I think everyone generally gets that, hey, my car was made in a factory, right? Well, in those environments, they're going to be full of instrumentation and equipment. And then tying it back to what we do, I like to use the metaphor. Um, I, care, I, 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 uh, I relate it to our bodies. So we have senses. We can taste, see, hear, detect temperature. We can feel pressure. Uh, we have muscles that allow us to manipulate the physical world. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, nerves that tie it back to a brain that coordinate all those functions and um, uh, act, make us act in a way that aligns to some strategy. And so that's what we do for industrial facilities. Um, and so our engineers are uh, using technology to bring that brain to life. And so there's a lot of programming, creating graphical user interfaces and alarms. So uh, technicians and managers can uh, get oversight of their facilities and kind of Tying it back to what product, productive learning does and why I appreciate this opportunity and why I chose this coaching group. Um, the problems we solve are very complex. Yeah. There can be hundreds or thousands of devices um, in these plants that we oversee. And being able to effectively communicate with the client and all their stakeholders is crucial to building the right thing um, and to mutually get on the same page and, you know, it doesn't matter if it's industrial automation or some other field. Um, doing that can always be a challenge. And then two, uh, our particular solutions require a lot of teamwork. So multiple engineers analyzing and making decisions on a daily basis. And my career has shown me that the dynamics of this human machine that we are are a major factor to the quality of the technical outcomes in our projects that we achieve and to meeting uh, schedule and budget, which really are just expectations with another person, right? Um, right, so, yeah. So we are people, how we feel can affect the assumptions we make, it affects our decision making, the opportunities we see, our communication quality, frequency, and our motivation. So um, as I've grown in my career, I've leaned more on those latter parts, especially leading a team of people. Wow. Yeah. That's, it's, it's such a great way in how you, how you explain that, how it doesn't really matter what the product or service is. You're still usually dealing with human beings, uh, especially when you have such a big project like that and human beings who are highly intelligent, who are successful, who are um, bright, 
and who care a lot about uh, making sure the solution fits, right? And then we also, with that, uh, have different opinions at times and different ways that we're looking at the project. So I could see where it would be, like when you talk about like developing your skills in terms of communication and uh, clearing through assumptions, it's like how, uh, how critical it would be to see like, well, let me see from your perspective so that we can incorporate that into the project if needed, or we could really have a dialogue about it instead of making assumptions and creating something really complex and then only to find out that um, there was a key component left out could be a, a project failure, right? Like that just because of the communication could, it could really affect your business and how engaged we are with the client because you can technically build uh, a technical thing that works but it's not what they wanted or they wanted something else yeah. and it's actually been a lesson of mine um because uh, us engineers get so analytical and focused on making the technology work at times yeah. um that we can miss you know body language cues in a workshop for example and i, I distinctly remember one time where uh that I noticed that I noticed the client in front of me was really disengaged, stopped asking questions. And um, I was actually able to stop at least that time, probably not earlier in my career and say, Hey, it doesn't seem like we're talking about the right things. And, you know, it opened up a totally different conversation and it's such a subtle cue. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Even on video, you could do that, right? Like even if we're not meeting mm -hmm. in person, you could still say like, I've noticed that in in the you know Zoom meetings that I've had in the last six weeks that I can t I can, even though we're on video I can still sense like emotionally if someone's um, yeah. low or engaged yeah. or they maybe or seem distracted I notice it in myself as well you know especially if I've been on like a six seven hour virtual class which I've done and so it's like okay understanding my own internal system and how I'm showing up and then also looking at the other people and see how they're showing up. It's, it's really interesting how we've had to adapt, which I think, um, you know, you were going to talk about some tips that in terms of productivity that you used kind of before you actually use them before COVID-19, but now um, have emphasized and are, are, I think planning on continuing like these best practices in terms of productivity. What have you, uh, what have you guys come up with over at um, Enterprise Automation? Yeah, today I'm going to share three tips, and I think a lot of them are rooted in things we already did, but in this new situation where we're having so much work from home and so much concern from what's going on and distraction, how effective they were really carried over into this new situation and made us realize how good of best practices they were. So three tips, um, and it's kind of, you know, the frame of our discussions, like how, how can a business um, serve their clients in this, uh, this new world? And yeah. you and I, the day we're talking now, at least in California, things are starting to head towards opening up probably in the next two to four weeks. Regardless, I think they still, um, they still apply. So the number one thing, um, to help the clients in this time is um, from a service or providing value angle, business continuity. What do you need to do to keep doing that? Um, and for, for me, the tip centers around championing the routines that lead your business to drive action. Um, hit schedule, meet budget for your client. Um, getting information from the client uh, is gonna be, is often harder at times. Um, but find out how they're doing personally, get a feeling for what they can support. Because even if we head back to work, um, I think a lot of this remote meeting stuff is going to continue. Mm -hmm. So when we started this process and we're still feeling out the state we were going to be in, um, our, we had our project managers systematically go through all our active clients and contact them in person to find out um, how are they doing as a person? A, like in person, meaning like phone, voice to voice or video? Or? Video anywhere we could, yeah. which is tip number two, but I'm still oh, tip sorry, number sorry, one. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm getting ahead of myself. What are their policies for uh, 
social distancing and what, what are they doing at their companies? How do we support that? Um, and how do we support them to still be successful in their projects? A lot of the stuff we do because it's industrial in nature and a lot of that continued, like you and I are still drinking water. So that water treatment plant. Yes. Thank goodness. Yeah. The working. essential, really essential businesses of the infrastructure of our communities and our, mm -hmm. our county and our state. Yeah. It's, we don't so, think about all those things necessarily. We just assume that it's going to be working, but it's still a and business. And so to wrap up point one, wrap up to wrapping up point one, uh, your business, you did things successfully. You had routines uh, that allowed you to meet your deadlines. Keep doing those, adapt them to the new mediums. So that's, that's tip number one. Yeah. Um, tip number two, mm -hmm. um, we started mandating video conferences for all client phone calls, at least if they were willing to, of course. Um, um, and probably in the first week or two that we started remote work, which was mid-March, um, some of us noticed that we had much better conversations. And even on a personal level, like we felt better when there was video present. Mm -hmm. And so as, as a management team, we, we mandated um, using video for any anything over five minutes just to make sure um, that we try to maintain some connection because you're going to lose a little connection yeah um, and we're a strong in-person team environment so remote work was not much of a dynamic we did too often um, and we found it it has helped quite a lot so we moved to mandating video calls and then per you and i our opening discussion i think even after um, the uh, the most significant COVID distancing practices uh, start to fade. A lot of the lessons we've learned from doing our business routines through video are going to carry over. We're probably going to end up doing more remote work and we're going to exit with a much better tool set. But use video. Help maintain personal connection. I think you, you, um, you wisely highlighted that yeah, I mean, it's not quite eye contact, but it's close. You can see their body language. You mm -hmm. can see they're in their house and they're in the same situation you are. It just fosters a better connection. So that was tip two. Yeah, I was going to even mention too. A lot of times I know in certain businesses, when we talk to our clients on the phone, we may not actually ever see their face. Like you can have a relationship with someone that you never even know what they look like. And so this has allowed us to kind of, even if we had that, and I don't know if that was the case with any of your clients, but um, sometimes in a business, you may not see the face of your client. You just are emailing or on the phone. And so with vid video, it's like, oh, oh, that's what you look like. Oh, you know, it just kind of creates that other uh, layer of connection. Like I think what you were talking about, relatability and uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I love that. Cool. And I, I definitely noticed that on a personal level for me. I was actually pretty anti-remote work before. I guess I was a dinosaur and uh, um, at least for the kind of team environment we had structured and the kind of people we hired, um, but it's totally changed my mind and the biggest difference has been video conferencing. Yeah, I mean, productive learning too. We all love, um, I mean, we have some remote pieces because we have, you know, a, half of our business is in San Francisco, but even with that, we would still, um, still did all our stuff in person and now we're like oh okay there are certain things that actually work fine uh virtually and yes we absolutely miss having everyone you know we we do crave that in-person uh connection but um we're starting to go okay yeah there's some there's some ways that we can make this work so in, in yeah. april linda lyndon a crow who's my coach and the president there product of learning we we did our clc monthly meeting on zoom just to yeah. say hey why don't we try half of the day, see if we like it, we'll continue. Yeah. And within five minutes, I mean, it was, it was just awesome. We had the personal yeah. connections. We were talking about business, coming up with strategies, you know, to improve, get better results and celebrate our wins. Um, yeah, I love that. Yeah, I, he was telling me how much it worked and I, he's got a group now in San Francisco, which um, I don't know, you know, if they'll maintain the virtual piece of it, but uh, they're doing that currently. And uh, it's great because I know he was, you know, originally going to like fly up there. And I'm like, well, now maybe, I, I don't know what his plan is to do that, but it really opens up a lot of uh, doors when we start to realize that, oh, you know, we can connect this way. Anyway, so thank you for that. And then I know you had another tip too. 
Yeah, tip, tip three. three. Is, tip also. <laughs> tip, three, um, tip three is one of these ones that we were already doing, but happened to help in COVID times. And we're going to continue doing it. So whether remote work or not, I recommend it. And so we have a project management practice here at Enterprise Automation where we email uh, all our clients status on the projects every two weeks. Um, and we kind of just consider that a background routine, a heartbeat, if you will. Uh, our people are still talking on the phone, uh, keeping up with clients in meetings, but it's almost just a, um, an, uh, an underlying behavior to make sure they are getting information before they ever have to ask. And we've never had a client once say, it happens too often or I don't want to get more email. Um, because they can always file it if they're too busy that day or go back to it. But hey, here's the things that happens. Here's what we're working on. Here's things we ran into. Here's things we need for you um, to keep our stuff going. And we find um, we get a lot of unplanned feedback through that mechanism where um, someone may not have mentioned on a call or emailed us that they can't make a meeting. But once they see that email, they'll all of a sudden they'll get in their mindset and respond. But why it came up in COVID 19 is. You know, a lot of, uh, there's a wide variety of how businesses handled this. And one of the feedback we got from our staff, they really appreciated our, our management team was um, very on top of things in terms of communicating with them. Here's what we know, here's what we're planning on doing, uh, here's what we expect the next week. And it's just kind of how we expect to do things. So we didn't think it was special. Um, but then we started hearing stories from uh, staffs, family members, and friends where their companies weren't doing that. And it made me reflect on this practice, tying it back to the client, that it was also a way uh, for our clients to realize, hey, we're still in business. We're still working on your stuff. We're still thinking about things. We still need your input if you're available, of course. But uh, that best practice that we had already been doing really, um, I think, helped us transition with our clients um, to continue executing well everyone's suddenly at home trying to figure out how to make all this stuff work remotely if they're working at all. Um, right. And I think it answers that or it, it puts in place like a preventative measure where if uh, let's say someone is, work, you know, you hired a company like uh, EA to, um, to, to work on a project. And then if you don't hear anything, you're kind of like, Hmm, as a client, you're kind of like, I, I hope that they're, you know, gosh, they, are they going to meet the deadline and how are they working on it? And so it's powerful to have that communication before you start wondering what's going on as a client, right? Like, and then, so it's just like, and then you, it sounds like you guys have really just maintained that practice and then they grow to expect that, which means kind of like, they don't have to worry about yes. wondering if it's happening. It's like, I know I'm always going to get an update. And then that, is kind of like my reminder to go, oh yeah, I was going to tell you guys, blah, blah, blah. But I knew that I was going to get that email so that I could just respond that way instead of it sort of being out of sight, out of mind. And you're thinking as a, as the, the vendor, uh, oh, you know, we're set on this meeting date and time. And then all of a sudden you're, you've got on your calendar and you're like, uh, where are they? <laughs> and then this way it, it allows for that more successful communication. Yeah, and I, I think I would also like to add a very subtle piece to it. Um, not everyone experiences this way, but what it is essentially doing is you are, you are providing mental freedom for those stakeholders. Yes. Um, not everyone's going to see that email Wednesday and all of a sudden, I feel mentally free. But <laughs> it does have that effect that, oh, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to check that in. That's not these floating X number of action items in my head about, my project vendor, what are they doing? Did they capture my notes? Uh, are they building the right thing? And uh, it's funny because the practice has kind of polarized me the other way in terms of when I'm the client and someone else is my vendor and yeah, I have to manage you're like, them. Wait a second here. <laughs> Hello, I haven't heard from you in six weeks. Is are we uh, still going on? You know, it's, are you still planning to? come update the thing in our building or even my house for that matter. So right. those were my three tips, maintaining <laughs> business continuity with the new tools, you know, uh, the routines that work for you, lean into those. Two was um, video conferencing, helps maintain a, a personal connection. Um, 
with whoever you're with. And then Zoom lets you see a lot of parties at once. And that tends, in my experience, to um, improve the team meeting dynamic. And then three is uh, create a communication heartbeat, email or otherwise with your clients, just a default communication channel. It really helped transition into COVID times and I guarantee it would help. Um, even I love that, that communication heartbeat. That's a cool name for it. I like that. Did you just make it's that? A it's a technical term. We talk oh. about that. <laughs> When our controllers in the plant are talking to the software up in the manager's offices, they maintain a heartbeat to know if oh. both sides are still alive. <laughs> oh, cool. I love that. I'm, I'm going to use that. Very cool. Well, thank you, Chris, for being on my show again. The first one will forever be archived in our memories. <laughs> but this I actually like the second one better. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's so always awesome talking to you. And I just appreciate all the, the support and your insights and learning more about how you guys do business at EA integration, because wow, that that's really powerful. It, it, do you want to share the website? I mean, is this, would it be appropriate? Do you want people to get a hold of you somehow? I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I do a lot of recruiting for our company and kind of I get hit by that channel a lot. So I, I tend to post a lot and okay. my profile's pretty you. blinged out. www.eaintegrator.com um, is a place to check us out. And we're very cultural minded. So there's a lot of content there. Um, and then, yeah, we're, we are an engineering organization striving uh, to bring emotional intelligence to our work. And um, it's not, it's not a uh, new wave stuff. Like our industrial automation solutions are better because we're working better in teams of people essentially. So yeah. I would check out productive learning website too. It's helped me a lot in, in my life and my career. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for being on our show. Uh, for those of you listening, remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel and uh, check out eaintegrator.com our enterprise automation integrator. And I'm Lisa Reed. Meanwhile, remember to do something kind to yourself, for yourself, and for somebody else as you go along your merry way today. We'll see you later.